Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our diversity discussion in partnership with Hall of Flowers. I'm Adrian Farkerson, founder and chief creative officer to Mary Magazine, and we're happy that you're able to join us today. As we continue, our next panelists are Guy Rocourt of Pop and Barkley, Al Harrington of Viola Brands, and Reese Benson of Posh Green Retail, as we discuss why diversity matters in the cannabis industry. Please welcome our guests. Hey, how are you? How's it going? Hi. Hey, Rita. Hey. How's everyone doing today? Good. Excellent. Good, good. I believe we are Jay and Humble. Uh, yeah, I believe we are still another panelist, but we are going to get started and then just, you know, jump into the things. Um, so, Guy and Reese, let's start off by talking about what led you both to want to enter the cannabis industry and start your respective brands. Uh, Reese, you go first. Go ahead. Ladies uh, first. Okay. Well, um, I entered the cannabis uh, industry about le well, legal market. I'm thinking. 2016 and uh what made me get in the industry was honestly i was a cannabis user but not in high school like most people um i started using it for anxiety when i moved out of california which was strange and it was hard to find so when i got back to california um cannabis was legal um from atlanta when i moved back and um i don't know it was kind of like i was put here to do this because i wasn't a big cannabis user but then I started getting into it and then it kind of fell in my lap. And then I just took the ball like a quarterback and made some touchdowns. Nice. Um, as for me, uh, I started, uh, you know, professionally in cannabis, you know, about 20, well, 19 years exactly. So it's, you know, for the majority of my adult life, I've been in the cannabis industry. Before that, I started, um, advocating. I worked in entertainment. Um, when I left uh, the military, I went to college and immediately went in entertainment. And I worked with Montel Williams. And as you guys know, he had uh, came out with MS in like the mid 90s. And uh, I was on a film with him. And I, you know, just got into it with him. We started advocating. He actually helped me get my gig here in California. And when I came to California, we were doing some advocacy work, but I saw the system here, the 215 thing. And so I started a small little just hobby grow. And then I found my partner, ex Harvard grad that had, had taken him out of the workforce. And I was still traveling by coast. And I was like, well, you know, watch my, you know, grow. And, you know, he was at that time, he was afraid to get his own script to go to a dispensary. This is in 2000. And I'm like, well, I don't care. I, you know, I've already served. My name is everywhere. It's like, <laughs> I'm getting a script. It's like what I believe in. And so we were sharing and then two lights became four lights, you know, and so on as it goes in the traditional market. And I thought, you know, that because we had these, you know, original propositions that, you know, these regulations would roll out and this would become a thing. And I started saving money thinking, oh, we're gonna do this. And of course, you know, almost 15 years passed. And then I got my first opportunity um, in Colorado. Um, one of the things I had learned, you know, beyond some basic cash making was uh, a formulation to dissolve cannabis oil into propylene glycol and make an original e-cig. So I started making these uh, e-cigs and I was shipping them to some of my, you know, current clients. And of course it's a much smaller pack, much more volume. And of course it's totally new. So I get people like just really throwing money at the situation. I was like, well, I'm good in California because I knew <laughs> tape and was irritated and didn't believe we would ever get licensing at that point because we've been through so many shenanigans after Proposition 19 and all the infighting in the state. And I said, well, I don't know anything about Colorado, but I'm down. So these gentlemen found a distressed license. I went out there, um, set up one of the first labs, started extracting, started this vape pen company. And, you know, I actually met Al out there the first time with Viola Brands. This is back in 2012, 2013-ish. Um, but I learned the biggest lesson uh, when we think about diversity is you have to know where your money comes from. Because at the end of the day, you can be as creative as you want. First money in rules the day, no matter what. And I, you know, my first partners were, you know, they were decent people, but they were venture capitalists and they were only about the money. And over these years of advocating and, and growing in the traditional market, I have a very 
green heart. I have a mission to bring safe access and normalize cannabis in a way that requires a little bit more than just making money in the business, right? And so that relation started to get a little frustrating there uh, with their lack of desire to advocacy and push the game in Colorado. And then luckily I met my partners here at Pop and Barkley. Uh, and you know, while again, New York, white market or white Wall Street money, <laughs> I'd put a color on it. Um, uh, they were at least a little bit more canvas friendly. And I'd like people to know that our original friends and family uh, round of 70 investors all invested before the ballot, uh, before Proposition 64 was on the ballot. They were definitely into moving this medicinal cannabis thing forward. So I was like, okay, learn something here. You know, I learned something, moved up and yeah. see what's next, you know, in the future. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I um, agree with you. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I know I was very short in the beginning, but I agree. You have to know where your money come from. Um, when I when I did, you know, jump in the business with, you know, quarterbacking or whatever, um, my dad had been incarcerated um, and just actually got out of jail a few months ago for uh, selling cannabis and other things. Um, so I always been around things and seen it. And so when I got the opportunity, it was honestly, my dad came to me, he was still locked up and he wanted, you know, his friends, when you're in federal prison, you meet a lot of people and they had farms and land. And he's like, find out how you can test cannabis so we can sell it to clubs and we can do distribution. So I was like, okay. And, you know, it, I kind of start reading and research and it's 2016. And then they wasn't ready. And um, at the time I was going out with someone who owned a few clubs and um, couldn't go back to the club anymore after things happened, after we stopped going out. And uh, I just said, I'm gonna start a delivery. The city said, no, it's illegal, you're going to jail. But I seen other people doing it. And that's when I started with my posh green delivery. And then I got the first license in 2018, the first 10 in San Francisco to be awarded. Nice. And you have to know where your money come from. And I'm a sole owner of both of my license, the first one, and actually my retail license. Because it, for me, being affected by the war on drugs, it would, if I let people come and get a piece of what I've worked hard for, and that took my whole family out, literally my whole entire family was wiped out by the war on drugs, it was on crack. You know, imagine growing up like that when everybody in the house is on crack, but your grandmother and your cousins. So for me, one store or just being in this business is not enough to repair what it has done to my family, what it has done to break us up, what it has done to the communities that I see every day. So, you know, it's it's more than money. You know, this is our 40 acres that we're never got. Um, Ruth, my next question, you're the first black woman to open a dispensary in the city of San Francisco. Congrats to you on that. How does it feel to be a part of history and what do you want the community to learn about posh green retail? Um, it was kind of crazy. I think I still don't get it, you know, um, because for me, every day I'm just working to accomplish the next goal. And so when that happened and when I heard about it, like, oh, you're make history, no one's so owner of a cannabis club, like, and it's not even heard of in the United States, uh, let alone, you know, being here in San Francisco coming from nothing. It was kind of amazing. And I know um, for me, it was put here. Um, I will, I'm really a big believer in faith in the Lord and in manifestation. And I feel like everything in the way it happened, you know, I had some partners early on that I sold my delivery to a part of it and things didn't go right. So I was able to take all the money that they gave me, which was a nice chunk of money and then get my license back um, because I'm very smart. And, uh, I've been my own lawyers, my own everything up until probably a couple of months ago. I didn't have a lawyer. I didn't have uh, admin. I didn't have anything to get through any of these processes because I didn't have the money. And I just pretty much did it myself. And uh, that's why I know it can be done. Like this is one of the hardest business out there. And for me to be able to accomplish these things alone and to be a trailblazer and to be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on I'm feet. I'm going everywhere. I mean, everybody, you know, so. Um, it paid off for me to like really get in the mud and go to all the events. People are like, you're at all the events because it's new for me. I need to learn. I need to know. I need to, I need to know, you know, when I'm interested in something, you are just not going to stop me. Cause I, I want all the information. I want all the smoke. Like they say it, like I really want to learn. And, um, 
And when I got into it now, it's like, it took me on a path like no other, like, you know, making history, showing people you can really do it. Uh, coming from, you know, uh, a dad, my dad was a hustler. I'm going to just give it to you. Like, you know, I get my hustle from him. He was a great person. He is a great person. He's very loyal. He don't, you know, he's always there for people. And that's kind of what got him locked up was being too, too nice to people and too loyal and trying to help a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. And it's tragic because it's like, unlike other situations, it was uh, my son's father who uh, turned to the police and put him there. And so, you know, going through the crack, going through that and, you know, everything, you know, you have to be strong and you can do it no matter where you come from. You just have to have your mind right. You have to know, you know, what you're worth. And, you know, I fumbled a few balls. I lost a few contracts, a few million dollar contracts, you know, and it's fine because I know I'm where I'm supposed to be at and I'm on the right path to go to where I need to get to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Gene. Talk to us about getting involved with Papa and Barkley from the beginning and your role at the brand now. Yeah, for sure. First, you know, I, knowing how hard it is to get licensing, uh, at least that is amazing. Um, it is difficult. I, you know, at Papa and Barkley, we have a whole compliance department and even our first licensing, one of our partners, John O'Connor, um, was here in Eureka and on the city council uh, board. And he was like, hey, they're giving out R&D licenses this before 64. And it was still a hard road. And we definitely, yeah, it was, you know, doing it yourself, <laughs> respect. I, I totally get that. Um, as far as like, yeah, you know, I was, uh, you know, in California, I was still doing my thing in Colorado and I still have an equity stake in that company. And, you know, I was blessed to have a job and literally be offered another job. So. That's always a good thing, right? Um, you know, the scariest moment in my uh, recent history was when I shut down my grows. You know, prices were falling. I saw the writing on the wall and we started to downsize and I got this opportunity in Colorado, like I said, but I was a little frustrated and I met my partner, Adam, through a friend, a gentleman named Sparky Rose. Shout out Sparky. He's one of the original California people um, and in fact did you know, some time for, you know, having a dispensary. And when he got out, was kind of on probation. And, you know, that's when I actually met him and he was a little mentor to me. He was out of the game. He's now in Chicago doing uh, graphics specifically for cannabis and actually helped design the original Pop and Barkley logo. But he put me together with my partner, Adam, who had done this bomb for his dad. Um, and so he was like, you know, what do you think? I looked at it. First thing I decided to do is, of course, use, you know, a uh, typical light hydrocarbon extract. That's what I was used to making at the time. It literally didn't work as well. So I started to realize one, his bomb because of the way he did it at home with a crock pot was much stronger than the topicals I was seeing out there. And two, maybe there was really something to, you know, doing this solventless lipid infusion and keeping the green material and these other stuff. So while it's not a golden extract and, you know, at that time, the clear was everything. And we were just getting the ability, especially in Colorado, to refine cannabis and use all these tools that I remember being denied even in the original thing. So it was an interesting point in time. I meet Adam, like I said, and I'm looking now for people who want to press cannabis forward. And it's 2015 at the high times in San Bernardino, which I missed those events right now. Oh, God. <laughs> So we're walking around and, you know, Adam looks a little bit like, you know, that classic, like white dude, you know, you know, late 50s, you know, white hair kind of vibe. And um, I, we see these people waiting for dabs. Dabs are just coming out. They got this electronic rig and fools are lined up. And don't you know, he just sees it. I'm like, oh, that's a really cool dragon thing. And, you know, kids are not paying attention, just cuts the line steals a dab off of this thing, blows it out and just keeps it pushing. And I was like, okay, well, at least this person understands and has no fear of cannabis. This cannabis game, something I'm really sensitive to. As we professionalize the organization, we bring newbies in and they are stigmatized. They're biased towards cannabis. They don't even know it. It's not unlike when people are biased towards, you know, people of color. It's like this thing that even as you're trying not to be biased, they're still messing it up. Right. Mm -hmm. So at least I, I found my partner as we raise money. I'm looking for people that really want to push the the thing forward and yeah while i have we have four co-founding partners adam and i specifically like in my little lab uh which was one of my grow houses in la started to formulate the original product suite he put up his first cash you know and started to help me with the expenses of the lab and you know like look if we could raise money would you leave your thing in colorado and at that point i was like yeah i want to do something in cali this is happening 
Um, so we went out, we raised this money, friends and family, and then it was off to the races. And, you know, with topicals and tinctures that stuff in the traditional market, that was not a big sector. One, we weren't testing for those things. So you didn't know about the efficacy. We knew nothing about CBD because unless you tested it and you knew it and you used it for seven days, we weren't seeing that efficacy. Everything was still basically based on milligrams of THC. Mm -hmm. So we start the hustle. Luckily, I knew a few dispensaries, you know, had a little book of people. So I'm like, we can get this out there. I'm like, I'm not about waiting to raise money. We got to start selling. So we started selling even before we raised money, just put it in a few shops, just the tincture. I mean, just the balm. And I made the tincture and the massage oil and the bath soak. And we're getting those all out. And we raised this money, get a facility up here. That's when we started making the patches and stuff. So, you know, yeah, it, it's very much, you know, uh, my influence as that cannabis person. Like when we raised the money, they were joking that, uh, you know, sizzle and steak. It's like, sure, Adam has raised money before, has the, uh, the you know, the kind of bon fides around that financial discipline. And I had the product space expertise. And, you know, at that time, it's like there are just not a lot of people who fit the profile, right? Unfortunately for us as people of color, you know, as we brought up, the war on drugs was made to marginalize us in ways that we don't even feel directly all the time. So many people that are in the canvas game have caught a charge and then that makes you ineligible to uh, be on certain financial documents and raises. And it's like, well, I, I, you know, it's like almost chicken and the egg. It's like, so I'm good at it. And so I'm lucky that I dodged a bullet and so now I'm eligible. How many people are not eligible? I mean, like those questions come up like immediately. And this year, they're so in our face, right? I, I think California is doing their thing for social equity. But anyway, for me, long story short is I've been with this from the beginning. It essentially started in one of my grow houses. I mean, we, you know, we like to do the full origin story and say that it started uh, in Massachusetts when Adam made the first bomb for his dad, hence Papa. But this is a California company with its, you know, we like to say our head is in Los Angeles, but our hearts in Humboldt because we did get to move here early and start to use some values that I hope the cannabis industry holds dear in terms of like sustainability, working with legacy farmers and try to put people on that, you know, have paid it forward. But, you know, four or five years in the rubber's meeting the road now more than ever, as we see in the magazines, the face of cannabis starting to look like the face of so many other industries in our in, in, in our nation. And I, I don't I don't know how we stop that. Like, that's a big concern for me right now. Yeah. Um, and at least my next question is we're talking about diversity. Like, how are you both inciting things for your organization and what can others do to do the same thing for their companies? Well, um, me, uh, a lot of people know that um, a woman owned, uh, when I first started, I didn't tell people I was an owner just because I was scared. Um, I know I used to be in black market and I know how people are, you know, think you got money and they'll rob you and different things like that. So finally, um, it, it was kind of pushed when I started working with uh, uh, the equity program with uh, Malia Cohen and Nicole Elliott that, you know, now my face is out there. And so I had to, um, you know, tell people, this is it. I am a woman. I am an owner. Um, but it wasn't my goal at first, actually. So uh, now, because it's so powerful to share with people and to give people hope, even people who had a better uh, start than me are, you know, it still gives them hope that you're a woman, you can do this because it's what point, we're less than what, 4% in the cannabis industry uh, of mm -hmm. African-American people. And it's, and I think, you know, for me, I want to let people know that we are here to service, you know, and black people can do business great, you know, not like half ass like people expect from us. So I set the bar high for my store, for my brand, for everyone in there. I want to be able to offer jobs and growth, you know, for my staff and, and encourage black women like a lot of the, the girls who work for me, they are in college or completed college and I'm, re I'm ready to go back to college, you know? So, you know, they are encouraged, they inspired and everyone that works with me um, because I'm not for me because we work together. Um, I'm a boss, but I'm not that type of boss that looks down on people because I've been there. So I like to create an environment of where we feel like a family, you know, because I want people to, everyone to feel the same. 
and you know mm -hmm. not feel like crabs in a bucket like it's only a chance for you and i think that's the reason why that a lot of um that a lot of us are not in the business because we don't want to share we don't want to promote other people that look like us because we're scared they're going to get the opportunity and they're not with me that doesn't matter to me. My friend just opened in her delivery service. She's a woman in San Francisco. Do I think that's going to take from me? No, it could take from the other person that don't look like me money, you know, but I'm not going to be scared. It's going to take from me. If, if somebody's going to grow, I want someone that looks like me to grow, you know, and that I, that is working hard. Not people that's inboxing me. Oh, can I, can you give me information? Can you give me information? Not those people. Um, you know, I don't mind giving the information, but you got to work hard. I'm up all night uh, studying. I'm going to yeah. different things, you know, and so I want to set the bar high for people. We can do it, you know. Um, who would have known I'll be doing this or even dealing with politics, coming from a house full of crackheads and a daddy that just got out of jail for selling dope and had a kingpin charge, you know, uh, not me, n never. And so, you know, I know what. Sometimes you have a plan, but it ain't your plan. You have to go along with what's out there and keep going and do it. When I go get up every day is not work for me. It's like, it's a lot, but it's passion because if I create something good for the community and um, and I'm giving back already, um, you know, and that was a big part of it. Kaliva and I did a partnership last year to give back. So any products we buy, um, Kaliva makes no money. It goes all back to the community and, it, and they give me the money to give back. So it's not like, oh, when are we going to get the check? You know, that was that was my goal. And I told them if I'm doing any partnerships and with a company like you guys, I where my store is at is used is it's gentrified, but it was it's the only black area left. And these kids need food daily. They need things, you know, like I was. It was days when I didn't have any food and things like that. So we want to set the bar high. And if you want to work with us and you don't look like us, you're gonna have to give back to us, period. Nice. Um, Key, do you want to chime in on that question about how you, yes. you know, for you know for us it's the same thing. Like you know, uh, a family vibe is super important, and I think that cannabis has uh, an ability to change how things are done. Right. So we all should be working together, and more importantly, I believe that is that just for the industry, growing the pie is better than trying to get more slices. Right. So yeah, I welcome people that are trying to hustle like I am. Right. We need more. People to help normalize cannabis and more people of color. I do take the point that, you know, we're guaranteed the pursuit of happiness. I think people forget the pursuit part. Pursuit means running after it. In fact, probably means breaking a real sweat. And <laughs> fortunate, especially when folks, you know, of color, as, as we put people that look like us come up and are asking for information, but not really. They're kind of just asking to get on your thing and not really looking to put the pursuit in. And, you know, there are some things like when we talk about diversity, when we talk about like bias, you know, cultural bias in our nation, we also as a community of color have some work to do, right? We should, all kids should understand the notion that we have a tendency as a people to fall into that crabs in a bucket, that this fear was instilled in us by people. And it's not only just fear of society, it's fear of each other, fear of uh, scarcity, right? And it takes a lot to rise above that because it's touching our basic instincts, our basic preservation instinct. And where that same bias that unfortunately even the police feel, we tend to feel, right? So that work that we're asking others to do, unfortunately, we also have to ask members of our own community to do. And that's when it's like the worst. Right. Because you want to help and you want to put a brother or sister on, but like you can't even begin to communicate the reality of the qualifications. I can tell you as our organization has bloomed and we're trying to professionalize it. One in Humboldt, it's not the most diverse area. So it's not like I have the biggest pool of people right in L.A. much better. But at the same time, you always run that fine line when you're a person of color of wanting to be too much on the inclusion set because you will get people that unfortunately are not in the pursuit and are just not really hustling hard. So if you want to only get hustlers on, yeah, you still will get diversity, but it won't be like you can make up for all the bad shit that's happened. Like being inclusive is, I find it difficult because, you know, I'm looking at the staff, you know, seeing like mostly men, even as it relates to just gender, seeing mostly, 
you know, not enough of enough people of color, not enough people of, you know, Latino descent. And you want to fix it, but you can't do that artificially, right? Because if you force the J, it, it, it could just blow up in your face, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. I've had it. I, I feel you like looking for staff and I'm, I'm blessed to have like, it's women, which is crazy. And there are beautiful women and they're educated, you know, and we want other people to work. But when people see you, they want to work there because they identify and they want the mentorship. Um, even my security is uh, I gave African-American uh, security a try because I want to be able to give my folks a try. Everybody else get a try. But sometimes it just doesn't work out, you know, but as long as I know I did it, it's it, it's OK. But it's 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 sad that we can't support each other. You know, the area that I am in, um, I have the same clientele that I had before educated people. We don't get a lot of people that look like me that come in the store. And that's how I was with my delivery, even though the area because posh, they see posh even. And we have we treat everyone the same. You could buy a ten dollar pre roll to. Uh, three hundred dollars. We that is my thing. Everyone in here gets treated the same. Customer service is very important to me. But then you have people in the community that don't know you and don't like you because you made it out the hood, and that will start harassing you. And I've been having that happen at my store. I don't just you know, and it's crazy that we hate hate ourselves so much, and that we have been conditioned to not like people and to think people think now you think you're better because you're doing something. No, I'm trying to motivate you. I'm trying to motivate the hood. Like Jeezy said, if you know, you read my story, you just call me hood. Yeah, I'm hood. So you seen I'm hood. I'm not ghetto. It's two different things. I'm hood. I came from the hood. I'm always going to be the hood. I love the streets. But what I do know is I learned from the streets what to do and what not to do. And unfortunately, once you get to a certain level, you just can't trust the hood no more. And it's freaking sad because I want to give back. I'm here to give back. But because people are not happy that you have elevated, it's hard to help your community. Yeah. Yeah. Funding being a huge factor for the POC community um, when it comes to entry, in the industry, entry into the industry. What are some other ways people can get their, get their start? Well, I would say that the first thing is education. I have people reach out to me, oh, do you have any mentorships in cultivation? The good news is Canvas is pretty easy to cultivate. So any typical agricultural uh, degree will do. Um, you know, yeah, you know, this is the, the way to do it is hustle. I mean, if I had to give somebody a tip, try, keep trying and don't take no for an answer. Um, you know, and don't be willing to take, you know, be willing to take risks, but they have to be measured. Like I think about my experience in the traditional market, you know, uh, it, it's it, it's dangerous, right? You take a risk, uh, but you have to believe in it. And if you believe in it, you have to be consistent, right? For me, cannabis, you know, especially, you know, seeing what it did for Montel, seeing what it, did, what it did for my partner in Crohn's, it's like, sure, I used it when I was younger and, you know, uh, recreationally, like most people, but it wasn't until I saw the true medical benefit that I was like, oh, I'm ready to push back, skirt the law, as it were, because this has now become a righteous mission. This is beyond just wrong. Like when I was using cannabis when I was younger, I was just like, ah, whatever, another lie I've been told or just being rebellious. But as I grew older and started to get in the business, I realized, no, this is a medical need. And I often say, you know, even beyond my service that cannabis advocacy and pushing for the normalization of cannabis is the most American thing I've done. Using our voices, getting together as a group with one righteous purpose and pushing forward is super important, you know, for our community then, uh, you know, as African-Americans and broadly people of color, we need to do the same thing. We have to look and say, we have been programmed to fear each other right? We all need to ask ourselves the question, are we really working that hard? And unfortunately, I think we have to take it <laughs> one step further and say, it's sad, but we but do not. Have to work harder. We need to work harder than others right now. And while that's not fair, it's true. You know, I know for a fact, even right now in my organization, I need to work a little bit harder than my partners to be accepted, to push forward. You know, because I, you know, I understand their biases out there. And until they're fixed by our good examples, you know, we got to, we still got to push a little harder. Absolutely. Um, 
Let's see, Reese, you opened up your shop during the pandemic of last year. Um, can you comment on how the actions of 2020 as a whole just impacted your <clears throat> business? Oh my God, like this, it, this was a, when I say uh, a super sprint to get this store open, I mean, um, I had this store since 2018, this location, that's number one. Uh, San Francisco, it takes a long time to get something open here. Um, and I had to pay rent. That's one thing. And I had to get insurance because we had some kickback of some people in the building. So unlike most people, COVID, I had a COVID before COVID. Um, we were, we got our license. We were actually the first people to get our equity license in San Francisco. We got our license in October of 2019. And shortly after, it was uh, some people in my building, which it was a black lady. It's always a, us who started this whole thing for me not to open. She befriended me and then she ran with it. And I got the first injunction ever heard of in, I don't even know, San Francisco or whatever. So I was actually stopped um, last uh, November right before Thanksgiving. And I had to fire my whole staff after we were geared up to actually open, open. Um, upstairs, everywhere, a lot of staff spend a lot of money in training, people coming by. Um, so I felt COVID then because I didn't know when I was going to open. I didn't know if we were going to open. I had to let everybody go. I still had to pay rent. I wasn't making any money and I didn't know what, what the future was going to hold for me. So uh, finally in April, uh, the judge took the injunction off, more money of the landlords who, uh, who I rent from never god's gift god had a plan um these people had never met these people until it was time to fight the fight the people in the building and these people spent over a half a million dollars fighting for me never once you know gave me a problem they wanted to see me rent win they wanted to see this happen and they supported me and they didn't look like me um and uh you know we finally got to open, you know, and thank God for their support, because I don't know if we would have opened if they wouldn't have invested that many dollars into the situation. And so then um, June comes uh, and I'm like, you know, COVID's never going to end. And I decided just to go for it. And we've been open since June the 16th. And it's been slow. You know, we didn't get to have a big party like most people to show that we're going to, you know, be open. We're in a new and upcoming area that's gentrified, but it's beautiful. And we're looking at the bigger picture. But it was it literally was hard. Like, but it, I invested everything in it. So it was like it's no going back. My house money is in here. Every dollar if this goes south. I'm going to be, you know, on the street. So I had no other choice but to keep going. And so. We had to cut back on some hours and stuff, and but it's going. I'm here. I'm open. I'm blessed, and it's going to get better. We got a lot of good things coming. My brand is coming out in a few months, and so we're going to keep pushing. Absolutely. Um, do you think more black-owned and POC-owned businesses will receive the attention and funding that they need now, as you know, the wake of 2020 discussions and moving into 2021, how there's a larger diversity discussion or racial discussion across America? Oh, man, uh, I, I wish I could say right out that the answer is yes. But I think that right now what we need to do is secure cannabis culture, which is really, in a way, a lot of our culture. I mean, when we think about the traditional market, when we think about how cannabis was put out there and how we were wrongfully or negatively associated with it, well, if I had to endure the negative, I should also get some of the positive and that's what's missing, right? So the culture in the face of cannabis is changing. And again, for lack of a better term, being whitewashed, it's starting to look like tobacco or alcohol. These are the players that we see and there's not enough reverence for how it used to be or how it should have been done, right? So, you know, as we see, like even for what little we can do at Pop and Barkley, we want to always look back to the traditional market and empower people and things the way they used to be and solidify them right before it changes. Cause as this industry is emerging, we're looking even just for like the definition of terms, standard ways of doing things, standard ways of presenting things, right? Some of them are driven by the BCC in terms of like, okay, every edible needs to be five milligrams, but there are other subtle rituals that we could hold on to that would ensure that people of color 
that concept of like getting cannabis from either women or people of color, because that was a big deal in the traditional market, right? So the same way you have two parallel movements, buy weed from women, there should be a buy weed from people of color, because that's what you used to do, right? How we lost that or how that's getting lost is interesting, right? Um, I, I wish I knew a way that I could make sure that it was kind of like a rule. I know that there's a bunch of social equity programs in Los Angeles and the Bay, and we're trying to by law, but yeah, there, there, there needs to be a little something else that says cannabis and our industry has to be part and parcel of African-American culture, right? Because you negatively associated it with us for so many years. And now that people can make money, you're taking it away. Well, one, we have to let it be taken away and we shouldn't. So I totally respect what you're doing, Reese, like taking a leap of faith, being an entrepreneur, believing in ourselves. One, as, as, a, as a culture, we're not always programmed to believe in ourselves, right? And the ones, the, those of us who do tend to run afoul of the law because they're guard posts that you're like, well, if I believe in myself, I'm gonna bust through these guard posts. Right. And I could get in trouble and with cannabis. You know, right now, there's a lot of people that are locked up for exactly what, you know, you and I are doing. You know, there are people locked up that, you know, made one mistake that I may have avoided. Right. Whether, you know, I remember being in dispensaries when police came in and just having my backpack. Oh, that that wasn't my backpack. And I'm like, I'm getting out of this one, you know, constantly having to to, to, to worry about those kinds of things have made it harder for us. But yeah, you know, it, it all comes down to the same thing that it always does. I know now that I would not have been able to raise money without my partner. I know I've learned a lot over these last two uh, businesses about this notion of being an accredited investor or, you know, being visible to raise capital. And it is not geared in our favor. It just isn't, right? You have to be, yeah, it's like, you know, we talk about bias in other places, but when you go sit in front of a banker or if you're lucky enough to, have a, get somebody to open up their Rolodex and get a bunch of people for an investment pitch, unfortunately, you still end up being a black person talking to them and it is gonna be a little harder for them to sign a check. It just is. There, I don't think that we are going to be allowed the me too businesses that other people are allowed. We're gonna have to be the innovators. We're gonna have to crack open new ground because I know if I just said, oh, I just wanna start a flower company, right? I'm not going to raise the money, but somebody else who maybe doesn't look like me that went to Wharton Business School is going to get that money to start essentially a, a, a business that there might be tons of those businesses, but they have a business plan and they raise the money. You and I will always have to have a little bit extra to get these bankers to sign the check. Yeah, I know that that's not a great answer, but it's, I think, the truth. And until it changes, we should be ready to deal. Yeah. Um, Reese, did you want to chime in on that question as well? Uh, just repeat the question again. About um, do we feel that more black owned and POC owned businesses will now receive the attention and funding um, moving forward? Mm -mm. Well, how can I say this? I mean, it's, it's people who like, they might, they might not. I mean, I know when I've first started to try to get an investor. It was like an investment list uh, in San Francisco where the equity people can kind of go. And I went to it and I did email people. And it's some people, big brands like Cookies that um, we had meetings with, but you know, I had a certain thing that I wanted, certain number, and it wasn't really high and certain things I wanted to do. I didn't want a partner. Give me the, give me the check. Why do you have to incubate me? You still going to get your store once you own your 100 percent store here and let me own 100 percent. But people don't want you to own nothing. So a lot of people want to incubate you, even though they're going to invest the same money and in incubating you at a place. They don't want to incubate you by yourself because that means your competition and you're taken away from them. And when I started seeing things like that, I was like, whatever, I'm not going to do it. You know, and I got a, a couple of crazy deals and I'm like, I'm not desperate. You know, either way, I'm going to make this happen. It might take me a little longer, but I think, like you said, we don't even have the confidence because confidence was taken from us a long time ago to be able to say I'm worthy to even go to this meeting, to sit in front of certain people, especially these billionaires, you know. And so when you do get in the room and you don't have confidence, you know, 
it's hard to to get a deal. But what I was taught, um, I'm a hairstylist and fashion stylist first, is fake it till you make it. And a lot of times I had to fake it and, you know, to make it to the next thing. You know, I've had my first meetings were with all big companies. And I was very blessed to first meet with uh, Chris, uh, Christian Goff from Pri uh, Ho uh, Leafly and Tilt Ray, like the owner. He gave me a, he literally gave me a meeting with no, no deck. And I was like, what, who is this person? I didn't even realize who this person wasn't literally to last year, you know? I, and then, you know, my next meeting was with um, Cresco Labs. And at that time was kind of royalty, you know? So I was getting some meetings out of nowhere um, from being in them fields, going to those events and stuff and going and people like who you work for. And I'd be like, actually, I carry your product in my store. I don't work for anyone. I work for myself. But that's the kind of um, that's what people say all the time when I go to things. Who do you work for? Who do you work for? And they don't know you're actually working for me because I'm selling your product. But I am not cocky like that. But it's weird when they see me. They don't think that I am own anything or, you know, or I'm the owner of it. Oh who is the boss, who really yeah, gave you yeah. the money, you know? And even now people think some weird shit. I got that money because I'm a hustler. I got that money because I'm smart. I got that money because this is what God had for me. And because it was a plan because we gonna make a difference and I'm here to make a difference and I'm here mm -hmm. to keep the culture. And I think, you know, are we gonna get money? I don't know. I haven't got any money um, from anybody. I, I won the Ease Momentum program and they gave us 50K, you know, and that came just in time, just in time, because I've been paying rent for all these years um, and I've had to pay insurance, which in Canada's insurance is expensive when we wasn't open. And I added another 25 grand to my bills last year, you know, the year before when we wasn't open, uh, including rent and things like that. And, you know, and architect and stuff like that. This is it costs a lot. And would it be investors? Yeah, if they can get a lot. Is more people jumping on the bandwagon of equity and people of color? Yeah, because it's a thing to do and they know they can sell their products and, you know, and it, it's a story, you know, and, um, but is without, should it be more people invested in us? Yeah, is it, who's to say? But I don't want someone to come and invest to take over and that's what, what I'm scared of. I don't want someone to tell me how to run my business. If I want to do a partnership tomorrow with whoever, guess who, 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 who can do it? Me. But if I have someone that owns it, then I might not be able to do that partnership or that person might not even want to do a partnership with me because that person has stake in other places. Mm -hmm. So um, when you're making these decisions, you have to think, what is my vision? What do I want to do with my brand? And right now I have a big vision for my brand, Posh Green, you know, retail. Uh, it's a cannabis boutique and we're coming out with our own products, you know, and that is really big. It's going to be really big once it's legalization hit is to have a, a, a really great product that people recognize all over the country. And so that's my focus now without investors. It could be an investor or not. I'm going to invest in myself. I take all my money and put it back in. There you go. Uh, Reese, I have another question for you. Um, you mentioned that you were part of like incubator programs or sort of like equity programs. Do you have any comment on those platforms, whether they're positive, places for improvement, things that you would like to see change or could have been different in your instance? It could have been a lot different. When we wrote it uh, for San Francisco, we had like four months to write it before January 2018 came out. None of us really knew about cannabis when we wrote it. Let's be honest, it's new for everybody. And so since it's new for everybody, you have to go to the internet and study. And that's what I tell people, even lawyers, there's no class for lawyers. They're learning just like you and they don't even know what the hell they be talking about half of the time. And so that's why I do all my own contracts. I make them turn them into term sheets. Term sheets are easy for you to read and you can sign. You don't need another lawyer if you don't have money. People don't tell you things like that. So um, with the equity, it's like we didn't know. And so, you know, it's a lot of things that should be changed. Nobody should be incubated in somebody's space. Like, what are they going to do after three years? Now you don't have a business. Now you need a space. Now you don't have money. You kicked out. Now you're out of business. It's a gimmick when you incubate someone in your space. Are these contracts? People I heard got into some bad contracts, even though it's looking really good, and they had lawyers. So I'm not sure what happened. But you know, um, it was times when I was very upset that I didn't get an incubator. 
when I went to that list. I'm going to be honest, but then I had to trust God. And what God had for me was what nobody else ever had history, you know, and he had a plan to make me do this. Do I want to do it? Keep doing it alone? Hell no. This shit is it's hard and it takes a lot of money. But am I doing it alone? Yes. And I mean alone, I mean payroll to the buy-in, to working in my store every day, to all my meetings. You know, I had a, a, a someone helping me uh, for like about a year. But before that, it was all me. And now because of COVID and cutbacks, it's all me again. And I think, you know, the equity program, these incubators, it's like... It, <laughs> Everybody know you're not going to make it without an incubator. It was never a plan for me to make it, honestly. No one ever thought we would make, I would be here when we create this program because I didn't even think I was going to be here. But things start happening. And then when I start getting into politics and seeing what's going on and how they're getting over on our people, I wasn't having it. It was time for me to step up, you know, and use my voice and get in and make some things happen, you know, um, And so I just kept going hard and it needs to change. This incubation for three years is BS. Like you cannot incubate someone in a space. I think if it's going to be incubator, they need to make sure the person gets a lot of the percentage and keeps it. And if not, get some shares or some equity in the business when the four years or five years are over or whatever it is. And I also think if they're going to incubate people in the space that they should help be able to help. I just think that should just be gone. I don't even want someone incubating another delivery in someone's space or another grow with a little small space. It's not worth it. It's stupid. And we should have never did it. And I'm not saying it's bad on Malia Cohen's or Nicole Elliott because we didn't know. Now that we know, we need to make a change and to make a lot of things happen, especially for equity. It costs a lot um, to go through planning, to get an architect, to have an engineer come down, to pay rent, to put a deposit down, you know, and a lot of people that look like me don't have great credit. They don't have no deposit. They don't have friends and family money at all. We, Mm -hmm. we barely have funeral money, you know, like, you know, think about where we come from. So for us to try to invest, we invest in something that makes us look good before we invest in something that makes us, you know, feel good and grow, which is crazy because we have been conditioned to fit in with other people and to conform, conform. And I'm not that person. And so I think that's what made me be a little different, you know, um, is I'm, I'll lose it all before I do things that I don't want to do. That again, sure. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I agree with you. The social equity program was kind of like, it was just ill-conceived. And, you know, in LA, when we have two interesting things, one, how they determined the the, uh, the zip codes of the marginally uh, compromised folks was pretty interesting because we had a, uh, a an actual older white gentleman on our staff that qualified for social equity based on where he lived, where he had his home. And I was like, OK, that doesn't make any sense. Um, we in L.A., you know, looked at folks to incubate. But just the notion of incubation why not reverse it? How about people that had charges, people that were in the game? How about they're in charge and they incubate you and your money who know nothing about cannabis and have paid nothing for this struggle, right? <laughs> it's like I have a lot of respect for people who who got us here. The we cannabis has been a thing pretty much readily accessible in our nation because a lot of people were trying to make sure it was always accessible. A lot of those people were people of color keeping this thing alive until the rest of the world finally came to their senses and said, oh, this has medicinal value. One of the cool things about COVID is that we did get named an essential business, right? Yeah. The validity of of cannabis is super important. So if it's now that we understand, oh, it is that important, these people who have been providing access for us throughout these last few decades, last ditch effort, you got to go find somebody, probably a person of color to give you that medicine because now you need it. Those those folks should be put on like, you know, girl, I'm glad that the VP, even though she didn't need to on the last debate, suggested the freeing of nonviolent cannabis offenders. I think that's super important. And I think that all those people who are hustling, trying to keep cannabis moving through should be allowed to find a way to get into the business. Right. Immediately. Right. So act like this incubation thing, I was like, I'd rather as a company say, oh, if we don't qualify as a equity applicant, 
we need to pay X dollars into a fund. And that fund is specifically for those who are adversely marginalized to go and get their loan, regardless of credit, regardless of whatever, because of they were marginalized and they paid it forward. That To me, that was such a straightforward idea, right? And I was ready to sign a check. But, you know, especially in the city of LA, this convoluted, no, you need to incubate somebody and mentor them. Then I was like, well, why don't I just hire this person? And then, of course, many of the folks, because of things out of their control, are not really qualified. And you're forcing me to look, look at an applicant and fill a role, especially as a business leader, you know, uh, that they're just not qualified for. That's sometimes the unfortunate reality. And if we're going to talk about incubation, then we should just talk about, well, there should be grants for them to go to, you know, a two year business school and get their business acumen up. So when they come out, they can put a budget together for their business. They can manage that P&L going forward, right? Because it doesn't matter how much I incubate you. If I'm not capable of giving you the actual basic tools to keep your business running when you're out, then you're just going to fail. What I'm going to come back and scoop you up and buy you. It's like it, 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 it was kind of like a false narrative to say, oh, look, we're doing it. But there's not probably going to be a huge outcome. Right. And not to be conspiratorial, but man, after all these years and, you know, getting to be almost 50 now. And when I was you know, a younger kid, I thought, oh, this is getting better. You know, and then when I served, this is getting better. And to now be see that the nation in many ways, especially as it relates to diversity and race relations, is worse off than when I was a kid in the 80s. I'm like, how did this happen? What have I been doing? Right? Um, you know, we also have to ask folks and, you know, my the young kids give me inspiration. I have a younger daughter. She's like, I'm Gen Z. We're built different. I hope that young kids are looking under the hood and keeping organizations accountable because that will help. Like when you look at an organization, you say, OK, well, I'm not going to buy from Amazon because they do all these things wrong. I'd rather buy from my local company because while it might cost me a few extra dollars to buy from them, at least I know that their money is going to go back into my community or they're going to do the right thing. That's happening. And with our community, people of color specifically, we need to reinforce that we just can't buy from everybody. And when we think about that notion of like spending money to make ourselves look good, to make up for things that we have been have been taken from us. Well, okay, that habit is going to continue, but at least let's make it thoughtful. Let's buy from brands that actually mean something, right? Not just mean expensive to so that I look like I have as much cash as my white neighbor. No, buy from brands that hold our values, that uplift our communities right? That should be the biggest sign of wealth for us, right? I went out and I purchased this from this. If you're in the middle of the nation, if you're a person of color and you're in Humboldt and there's not much of a culture and you decide to say, hey, I'm going to find shops in Oakland. I'm going to find shops in traditionally African-American communities. I'm going to make sure that anything I buy of expense, at least that company has diversity at heart, right? Or is trying to do something that's going to go a big way. You know, we are a big community in, in America and we don't tend to spend our dollars with ourselves. Right? A lot of the big dollars go out to these other brands that could give a crap about us. Absolutely. I agree with totally what you're saying. Like people are going to because we're mom and pop, we're small and we're hands on and I'm there. You know, people don't go into cookies asking for a discount, but definitely think they're going to. Oh, what's the special for today? It's like kidding me and we're so we do that all the time and it's like support your friend like you're supporting the person that you don't know you know and unfortunately it's not like that because it's just sad we got a lot of healing to do and i think once we heal things could be better and unfortunately uh because of the healing that we need to do in our own communities we don't want to spend money with each other we'll go down the street and spend the money at the chinese nail shop We'll go spend money at the um, a, the Arabic liquor store, okay? We'll go spend money at the good brands, you know, fancy brands and all these restaurants, but we won't spend money with each other. And it's crazy. You don't want to spend more money with me because you don't want me to be successful, but you, you want them to be successful. You know, and the same with brands. Like, I'm seeing, like... Um, we have a partnership with the monogram brand. And unfortunately, when it came out, people were talking crap. But when you see white products come out, you never say shit. 
You don't criticize it. You don't ask what they're going to do for the community. But as soon as you've seen the monogram, what is Jay doing? What is that? He was affected by the war on drugs, too. So if he never did another motherfucking thing, excuse my language, it would be OK. But you don't ask the other people, the other hundred brands that's coming out. What are you doing for black people? What is this? Oh, the packaging. Oh, they're charging too much. You don't break. You, 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 it's sad. You, you, it's really sad. And, and I've caught our own people doing it, you know, and it's yeah. like, what's wrong with you? I don't see you doing it to other people. Let's stop tearing each other down and build each other up. We we are the last of the last. And the way racism has is now, I've never seen it like that. I've been here since the 70s, and now we're in 2021. And I've never experienced racism as much as I'm experiencing it now. So we need to stick together. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a question for you all before we wrap up in the next few minutes. Um, Share your thoughts on what you would like to see coming from this incoming presidential administration um, as it relates to cannabis and diversity across the nation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking about it because, you know, of course, I wanted to say, you know, federal decriminalization, legalization. But now I realize we still are protected by this artificial barrier, you know, uh, I have a lot of respect for what you're doing, Risa. You know, I, I'm 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 low key jealous because I'm like I'm I don't get me wrong, I like my partners and stuff, but I kind of want to do it on my own like that, dude, and be able to be proud like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I think that right now, I would hope as much as I want in my heart, you know, decolonization and the total legitimization and normalization of cannabis, which I've been working for, opening up the doors too quick and allowing big money to pour in could just steamroll over us, and we would not be part of this anymore. Right. It would just be keep it pushing like all these other industries that we're excluded from. Um, so I hope that we get one, some tax reform. Right. So 280 and such. I hope that there is an active push with all the criminal reform, criminal justice reform to release nonviolent cannabis prisoners. Secondly, the key thing is every single kid who lost a scholarship or was not able to get a Pell Grant or something like that because they got a cannabis charge, that needs to go away first, actually, right? Because I think about my college experience, there were so many times I was acting like asshole that I could have got busted and in one ticket would have, would have, in, would have rendered me ineligible for federal aid that everybody else gets to go to college, right? In our, in our nation, it's the pursuit of happiness. And while we don't have free education, the fact is, if you're a hustler, you will figure it out, right? Young kids tell me like, oh, I want to go to college. It's like, just go. Stop thinking it's this huge mystery. Apply, get accepted, and figure it out. There are tons of loans, scholarships, and things you can apply for if you just push that hustle and believe, right? You just got to do it. That's how other kids are encouraged to do it. We should be encouraging our kids to do it. However, because of this systemic war on drugs, just I think we can all agree, designed specifically to hold people of color and socioeconomic, even poor people. So poor white people and all other minorities are strictly are targeted by the war on drugs so that little things like you got to charge and you can't vote in your community. You got to charge and you can't get a bank loan. You got to charge and you can't get a college scholarship. Well, those things add up to continue to marginalize us. And if we think about the first campus revolution in the 60s and 70s, well, we didn't get to stay on top coming out of the wars, right? And getting all our GI bills and stuff. Every, they kept putting little things in the road for us to stumble, to casually be disqualified from getting all those incentives that everybody else got. And now we have large groups of us who have not had the opportunity for larger for higher education, right? Now it's like, okay, well, I'm trying to hire you, but because of other things, I can't, right? And it's just all building up. So first thing would be, let's get kids back into school, right? Let's say that cannabis is normalized and you should not be held back from any kind of student loan or, stu or Pell Grant or whatever, just because you had a cannabis charge. That needs to be one. Then if you're incarcerated for such things, they also need to be expunged and not just let go, but expunged. Expunged so that you feel comfortable in the application that you don't have to list that charge. Right now, if you've got other charges, OK, well, maybe you got jammed up and there's nothing we can do. But there are plenty of people who just have cannabis charges that are either in or out of jail, that their lives are still being held up. Then 
I'd like when federal reform does, when we are able to get on the national, uh, on, on our stock exchanges, or when traditional banking investment money really starts to come, I would like there to be some protocols that that kind of hold that tide back or allow that money to come in the right way. That's going to be on us, right? That's going to be on how we hold companies and cannabis ac accountable. The good news is cannabis is like kind of already part of cancel culture. So, you know, I don't know if you guys know, like the treat well lady, when she was yelling at that young African-American girl for her water, we, not, that ain't gonna happen. That ain't gonna dude, happen. I won't mention the dispensary, but there was a dude right in your area. He decided yes, that he yes. would be all Trumpster on people and just be like, you know, all lives matter, whatever rhetoric he was saying. We jump right on that, right? Yeah. He's, he's quick. We need to keep yeah. that sharpness. We need to yeah. keep that attitude as part of our industry so that, yeah, when something goes down in our industry, we want to be able to raise the flag and be like, that person's in violation and economically margin drive them out. Because the strongest thing we have is our dollar, right? And if we have a system and a culture where when people run afoul of that or do nefarious things that we can speak to each other and say, hey, that person, you know, watch out for them and we actually do it, we say, hey, I'll go to the next dispensary. I'll walk that extra block. You know what I mean? I'll take an extra day. I'll spend an extra little bit for the right thing. I think encouraging that kind of feeling in our in in our in our industry, solidifying that would be great before the feds de decriminalize. So I would hope that with the, our new VP and and um and our new president Biden, that one. The other business of the nation, there's a lot of shit. We're still in wars that we don't talk about. We still need to deal with this universal health care thing, right? So there's a lot of important things above and beyond just what's going on in cannabis. Um, there's other, you know, never mind the police thing. It's like, I want it to be clear in every American's mind that we should not spend more on law enforcement than we do on education. That law enforcement is not educated enough to deal with mental health issues, right? Let's start having that conversation because we have some underlying systemic things that if we fix, then we can build on. But right now we're building on a broken foundation because we're not addressing the real issues. You know, I think this particular administration is poised to uh, to do it. Right. Um, I happen to have had the pleasure when Kamala was uh, running for D.A. in San Francisco. <laughs> Side note, she was Montel knew her. You know, they were had a date or two. And so I got to meet her. We got to go and do some radio interviews for her. I believe in my heart that she's not only a friend of cannabis, but she's the real deal. You know, I think she understands and was listening to this conversation, understands fundamentally the notions of crabs in a bucket of us also the same way everybody else is biased because of all the bullshit. Well, we got some of that too. We're watching the same media. We're getting the same programming and nobody's even telling us, hey, deprogramming your deprogram yourselves. We do have to deprogram the police and all the other folks and get their minds right. We also have to get the minds of our community right, right? Because we do see the 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 vestiges of that, like crabs in the bucket, that fear that oh, well, that, that there's only room for so many people of color. No, there's room for all people of color. So just because I'm winning does not mean you can't win. Let's just all try to win, right? Um, so yeah, here's hoping. Anyway, and Reese. for me. I need the VP and the president. I need, first of all, the VP, since she was the DA of San Francisco, to start here where she put people in jail for cannabis. We know she did put people in jail for cannabis and their life is messed up, you know, and just expunging people records ain't good enough because, like you said, now they wasn't able to work. They couldn't get a place. They couldn't get housing. They couldn't get different things. So imagine years of that. So now you keep getting in trouble because you need to eat, you need to feed your family. Not saying that you're robbing and stealing, but you might be selling dope, you might be selling weed, you might be selling anything because now you cannot do anything else. And so she did help make that happen here in San Francisco. So we need to have her undo that and to undo it for the nation. You know, um, she's here, she's from here, like she said, you know, certain people look like her. I'm happy a, a woman in, is in office, but we need to start somewhere. These people's lives have been drastically affected and will never be the same. And it kind of sucks because, you know, 
you can't do nothing. Like you said, you can't go to school. You can't do nothing. You can have greatness in you, but because your mom was on crack and your sister needed to eat, you sold some weed and now your life is taken and, and you're here and you're special and you're a gift. And we need her to reform that because when she was here, she knew what it was. She from Oakland. She knows the obstacles we go through. So we need her to see you with a clear vision. Yes. And that's what I would yes. and I would like for you know us to do some scholarship programs. Your life's been messed up. If you want to get in cannabis, let's start some scholarships. You know, you you reach certain points, you fill out the paperwork, there's money for you to start your business. You know, that's the things I've talked to Nicole Elliott about. We need to do scholarship programs, you know. It's a lot of things we need to do, but healing is a first and believing in our people is another thing. Stop looking down on us so you can get the next win. And I'm not saying that about her, but there's a lot of politicians out there like that. Um, they're not fighting for what they believe is right. They're fighting for the next position. And so they're going with what the majority want them to, to, to say and do. And um, and for me, I don't like that because I'm always going to speak my mind. I've had some talks with some politicians and they're like, oh, I don't like you. And I know that, you know, I know that some everyone's not going to like me, but if you're not gonna like me, you're gonna like me for standing up for something I believe in. And you know, we gotta fix things and we need to fix it. Ms. Harris, we need to fix it. We need to fix it. We we voted you in and now we're waiting for her to fix things and reform and 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 get us back to where we need to go. Absolutely. Um, thank you both for your time. We've had a great conversation um Lee Rocourt and Reese Benton. Um, we are actually out of time now and have to jump into our next panel, but um, where can people find more information about both your brands? Uh, me, Google, you can Google us at Posh Green Collective. We're on Instagram, Posh Green Retail. Uh, we've been shadow banned, so you have to put the whole Instagram address, but if you Google uh, Posh Green or Reese Benton, you can find out um, it's a lot of information and articles and stories about the store and about the movement. Um, yeah, and just keep following us because we got a lot of great things happening in 2021. Awesome. Yeah, you can find me uh, at Pop and Barkley, Pop and, at Pop and Barkley, Pop and Barkley .com, or me personally at Guy Rocourt. Um, and yeah, look, encouraging folks to learn about what we do at Pop and Barkley. Reese, respect, you're a boss, dude. I, so I aspire to be you, man. I need to, I now know I want to be like, I own all of this 100% because that is that, uh, that, you know, so respect for that. Uh, yeah, look, I, I look forward to hearing from everybody and uh, thanks uh, for putting this together. It was really great. Thank no you. Both. Really appreciate this. Thank you. All right, guys. Bye. Um, for our audience that is live, stay tuned as we will continue on with a female plant, a female conversation with Kimberly Dillon and Dr. Rachel Knox. Next, stay tuned.